Okay, welcome back. Hi over there. You can come sit closer. Hi, you way in the way back. You don't have to sit so far back. You can sit closer. It's okay. No one's going to bite. All right, try to sit closer. Hey, welcome back, guys. Thank you all for coming back despite the horrible cold and the, the, the general terror that Seattleites have about a little thing called snow. I really, really appreciate that you made it despite... Uh, it wasn't snowmageddon this year, I don't think, but uh, thank you again for coming despite what... I think there was some scare that we might not even have class today, and that would have been a, a horrible tragedy. I am really, really excited about this class. Um, I think we have got a lot we're going to cover. As I mentioned in the last class, uh, normally we would have you come, if you have a business idea and you want to recruit team members, you'd come to the front and give a pitch. But we're going to have a little social at the end of this class, and you'll get to do that then. So we're going to skip that at the beginning and give you an opportunity, if you have something that you want to pitch, to do so at the end over a glass of wine or beer or food or a non-alcoholic beverage or maybe uh, maybe some gluten-free vegan something well we, okay we'll get to that later all right so welcome back um, we uh, have an exciting class uh, to go through with you um, uh, anybody ever read Jack London's Call of the Wild all right Alexandra do you want to tell me anything about it no yeah, what, what was the main thing that you want to say if you had to pick two words about the call of the wild? Oh, he really romanticized traveling kind of through, you know, big open expanses like, you know, the tundra. Yes. It was pretty beautiful on its own. It was nice to see it like in, in, a, in a book form. So first of all, so thank you, Alexandra. So, uh, I, by the way, I have cookies. Uh, is there a type of cookie that you would like for... Uh, so I can tell you what we have. Uh, by the way, so uh, you'll learn more later, but... You, we chocolate, chocolate chip, everything vegan, and um, a sparkle cookie. Sparkly? It's like sparkly. Okay, so I'm going to give you one of those. Uh, I, you will know that I'm going to have uh, throughout this class, despite Sarah telling me that it's really not a good idea, I'm going to have a lot of vague uh, literary references. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, they're, I'm not going to change them, even though I'm way out of touch with reality. So thank you for uh, going to this. But I think behind this, Jack London was right. Uh, he's an author. I think authors and artists have something in common with entrepreneurs. They have to make something out of nothing. They have to have courage, right? Um, and so part of what we're going to talk today, uh, talk about today, is where you find that inspiration to make something out of nothing. Uh, so that's the topic for the day. So let's put that in a little context. Um, I went through all of this in the last class about the outline for the whole thing. This is where we are. We're at the beginning of the beginning, okay? Which is really just trying to get this whole thing started. Uh, as we talk about this kind of process of getting inspiration and, and, and kind of driving the catalyst for a new thing, because new companies don't have to exist, right? They, there's no particular reason. You have to create some sort of energy to get them to exist in the first place. We're going to talk about uh, how to get that inspiration, and we talk about it in three parts. The first is why. So again, why is a big question, right? If you can't answer why, <laughs> That why your company should exist in the first place, you probably shouldn't have one, right? Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of tools that will help you think through the process of answering that question why. And that, that tool is one of the most important ones we'll ever talk about. It's called the ABCs. And some practical uh, examples of how the ABCs work. Uh, and then we are extraordinarily fortunate um, to have a good friend and a person who I admire and respect a great deal, who has not only gone through this process of asking why, but then turned it into a real product and a real business, and then did it over again and over again, uh, as she faced the reality. That's Xiaoyu, or Renee Wang, who um, runs CastBox, uh, which is one of the most, really, it's the number one uh, third-party Audio, uh, spoken audio platform in the world from zero to that in four, uh, four years. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to have a panel 
of uh, awesome past competitors. They're all named up here uh, in these other programs. And they'll go through and talk about their quote ABCs. And we'll, you'll get to ask them also about their experiences in the business plan competitions. Uh, many of them have actually been through this, or some of them at least have been through this class. Uh, and then again, we're gonna, we're gonna end, hopefully we'll kind of move quickly through all of this so we have time to have a team building and finding party. Uh, I know that many of you have uh, filled out the little spreadsheet uh, online uh, and none of you have said, I want ever figured out how to join with one another because maybe even any world of uh, social relationships all happening through things like Facebook and Twitter and whatever the other, t what are Instagram. I, I don't use any of these things, so I don't really know. Uh, maybe even in that world, it's actually still useful to meet face to face in order to create uh, uh, some form of community like a team. So we're gonna do that, all right, with food and drink. So let's start by digging into this, this section on why. Uh, and I guess we'll start with uh, one motivation, which is cookies. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, you filled out a survey. I wanted to highlight the answers to this survey. Um, most of you really are happy to have kind of any uh, platform of cookies, but some of you do actually care about things like nut allergies, uh, paleo. So I, being a person who wants to respond to my target audience, uh, will attempt to provide at least some uh, vegan or nut-free uh, solutions for people. Uh, and then uh, you actually also gave me, so we actually do have uh, chocolate chip cookies tonight. Uh, because most of you, or 48% of you, said that's what you want. Strangely, even though the general population of the United States um, likes Oreo cookies uh, as the absolute number two, you're not that uh, universe of people. You like peanut butter cookies uh, next to chocolate chip cookies. That's actually also way off the norm, so you're pretty special. So by the way, this is teaching you that when you're coming up with a new product, you should actually try to study who you're targeting and what your preferences are. And then there were some other things, like some of you like, the, there's a lot of you, you know, there's or at least some of you who like other. And I liked this uh, pink frosted sugar cookies with sprinkles. So see, I felt like it was important not only to serve the majority, because the majority can be a tyranny, so we should also serve niches. Sometimes niches are really powerful. So let's serve the pink frosted sugar cookie with sprinkles niche. And I have yet to go to Subway to find a strawberry raspberry cheesecake. Who, who, who did that one? Raise your hand. So what? tell me about those. What, are they good? Wow. Okay, next time you go to Subway, uh, I'll give you five bucks. Can you buy some for us next time you go to Subway and bring them into class? Okay, so the, see, Phoenix may have a, Phoenix and Subway people may have a very different, there's a whole class we could have on their go-to-market strategy for testing cookies. But anyway, okay, so cookies, this is giving us a platform for our cookie um, uh, incentives on the go forth. So let's not go on to that too much. Let's move into the real topic of trying to answer the question, why? And why it's important to have some kind of vision, even though you and I had old conversation about the bullshit visions that lots of people end up having. Um, but what do we mean by having a vision for a company? Vision gets thrown around a lot of times. So what do you think, people uh, out there, what do you guys think uh, we mean by having a vision? Anybody want to volunteer? Cookies are at stake. Uh, yes, Dylan, thank you for bringing your name tags, by the way. And go ahead. What do you think we mean by that? The vision is like um, you have an idea for a product. You have an idea of how it's going to impact society. You have an idea of how to bring about that impact. Okay. So uh, a view of a better future that ought to be, and in your case, you're bringing it to the next level of like somehow catalyzed by a, a product or a new offering. Uh, so I, I don't, do you, are you a, a pink sugar cookie kind of guy? You are? I love it. All right, good. You get the only other pink sugar cookie. You want to pass that back to him? All right, very good. Uh, so appearances can be deceiving. Uh, all right, well, what do you need in order to have a good vision? 
Anybody want to? Yes, Michelle. A mission, and a mission statement to help guide your work. A mission statement to help guide your work. Anybody else got any ideas? I, I, you can get a cookie. We're going to run out of cookies early, but we have food later. Okay. Any other ideas? Yes. Beck, what's your name? Jeffrey. Yeah. Oh, I um, see it. Okay. You need a strong internal strategy. Um, your objectives within the company are going to guide your mission statement. A strong internal strategy and objectives to help guide that mission statement. So both of those, I think, are good things here. I, I To me... Um, you need you what do you need it for you need it to inspire motivate etc and I think this gets back to some of the things you were talking about this, this you actually need something in the end this will guide all of your strategy but it, it, in order to do that well and I think you said a mission statement it has to be articulated in a way that isn't complicated, right? And strategies that nobody can understand don't work either. So this actually vision, it may sound sort of silly, but in a way, if you don't do it right, it's really much harder to have a strategy, right? If you don't do it right, it's much harder to drive and motivate people. And if you do have it right, you can actually um, make yourself a, a more attractive, it can actually be more efficient uh, an operation of a company. So. Uh, what kind of, Michelle, we have a vegan everything cookie, we have a chocolate chocolate, and we have a um, chocolate chip something. What's I'll just go with everything. Alright, you're going to go with everything. It's a vegan everything. Are you vegan? I am now. Okay, this is the vegan everything cookie. You are now? What happened? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Jeffrey, you, you hungry? You'll pass. Pardon me? Uh, for later. Okay. You're very nice. So how do we get to this, this elusive, wonderful vision thing that we're talking about? Well, I remember we showed this in the last thing, you know, like planning. You need to go from point A to point B. You need something there. So the, the real thing is you got to remember there is a destination. There's some future that you want to have. And that tool... Um, there, there's, you, so it's great you want to remember the destination, but you also have to think about the gap. And that is this tool called the ABCs, which is very, very, very simple. Something I use all the time. Start with A. This is where things are today. Okay? Describe the current situation, where it is today. B is the desired future, where things ought to be that frustratingly aren't there. And maybe even feel, what you articulate them, it's like obvious it ought to be true, but they're not there. And then C is what needs to be done. Now you said mission statement, we'll talk about that later. I think it's a very important thing sometimes when you think about this is, if you do this right, it's, it's big enough, right, that it's inspiring in general. And you may not be the only part of making this future happen, right? So a great vision is not, I would like to make I would like to be a billionaire one day. That's my vision. That's not going to inspire lots of people, right? A, a different kind of vision could be world peace or something like that. And then you say, well, and it's not like that today. So what are the things that have to happen? And your mission that you choose, Michelle, is the role that you're going to play in doing this C piece, right? That makes that happen. Okay? This ABCs thing, I, you over and over and over again. And it's, it's a way, when you're trying to think about how to articulate this simply, this to me, by the way, is the fundamental part, the sort of baseline, first thing in strategy. Like, what place are you aiming for? Why are you aiming for it? And what's the core thing you need to do to get there? If you can't answer that simply, you just probably don't have one, right? So let, let's give a few examples, and then we're going to hand it over to the real people who have some, some true practice in this. So one example, oh yeah, there's another way to say this, yes where things are like this, but they ought to be like this, so this is what we need to do, okay? And I, I just think it's a good like little thing in your mind to just go, yes, but so, yes, but so, yes, but so. When you're giving a pitch, you go, yes, but I'll, I'll give you some examples. Let's move on to those examples. So, uh, anybody can guess who said this? Bill Gates. Who said Bill Gates? You get a cookie, yeah. All right, what do you want? <laughs> They're, they're gone. Yeah, you don't get that. Pardon me? Chocolate chip. Chocolate chip. Okay, good. I also have an apple. Show you, do you want that apple? Or? Okay. 
Uh, all right. So yeah, he was a geek. So he's biased, right? Um, but he's he, he was definitely uh, that was him, right? And it worked out. I'm going to let you pick this out. All right. So Bill, by the way, was a guy who had a very clear ABC statement. I'm going to. Can you just do that for me? All right. So here's Bill's ABC statement. Now this is ancient history, and I'm biased, and I bring this up because I used to work there uh, a long, long, long time ago. Um, so. Uh, you'll have to, this is a pretty dated uh, uh, vision statement, but I, I remember actually because one of the people I worked with uh, was effectively wrote, there was a book called The Road Ahead. I don't know if anybody heard about that. To sort of put the vision thing on the map. And one of my friends uh, actually listened to Bill and crafted some of these words. So yes, uh, the situation was there's tons of compute power out there in the world. Um, but back then in the 1980s, uh, it was still in the hands of a few very specialized people who wore white jackets and it was all hidden behind rooms, okay? Now, I know today we live in a world where literally on your hip or in your back pocket or in your earbud, there's as much compute power as was in any of those, any of those rooms. But back then, this was the, situa the current situation. But the vision that Bill saw was, why can't there be a computer on every desk in every home? Now, I know there is now, but back then, there just was not. That was a really, really, really bold statement. But it was also one was like, gee, why can't there be a computer on every desk in every home? Once you said that, that sounded like a pretty missionary thing to say. Like, let's make that happen. But more importantly, he said, so how are we going to do that? What's caught, what is that gap? What's the thing that's not making that possible? And he had some insight. He said, you know, the thing that's really getting in the way is that computers are not easy enough or cheap enough, okay? Fundamentally, if they were really, really easy and they were really, really cheap, then there'd be tons of them all over the place. So he didn't get to make computers cheaper, but he got to make it easier for the people who made computers to make them cheaper by doing something called open standards and ease of use. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, but you know, and in uh, sort of marketing speak when we get to that. But fundamentally, if you created a virtuous cycle of lower computer prices, more applications that made people want to buy them, you'd build an economic machine and the thing people talk about now, remember uh, that uh, we talked last week, our speaker about uh, flywheels, a flywheel and for a whole industry to start building cheaper and cheaper stuff and get massive adoption. And the mission for the rather than the vision, the mission for Microsoft was to build the fundamental software that made that easier. Uh, and in the process, it built a gargantuan, gigantic, near monopoly business. But fundamentally, it, that vision really, really drove the company for a, quite a long time. So I'm going to give another example, almost in the uh, a very different uh, direction. So uh, today, uh, this is, you know, we hear a lot about this, but you know, yes, there's been, there has been a lot of progress made in women's rights and LGBTQ plus whatever other letters we need to and rights out there in the world compared to what it may have been in the past. But there's still a super long way to go. Uh, and this, these are, this comes right off of the company I'm going to talk about. I'm not telling you who they are right now, but, uh, and we try to get them as speakers, but their website <laughs> Uh, says, we are all people. We should be in a place where we all feel like everybody just thinks of anybody else as just people. Instead of all these, you know, genders and all this, let's just all be people. But we're not there. Uh, we should be there because what's more human than being exactly brazenly, no apologies, who you were born to be. That is the, the view of the world this company thinks ought to exist. Now, what is the required action they think uh, needs to happen for that. Uh, this is a hint. So it should be a place where X equals whatever you want, right? You get to be whoever you want. And the answer is underwear, okay? So their vision was underwear, and uh, it's a company called Tomboy X uh, that uh, is here in Seattle. Uh, it's uh, two uh, lesbian women, a couple, who uh, frankly, we're inspired by their own problems, right? Like, hey, they had a certain taste and it was very hard for them to get the kind of clothing they really wanted. And so they took that personal thing and said, actually, it's a bigger problem than just us. It's, it's broader. So why don't we try serving that? And they listened to their customers well enough and found out, strangely enough, 
that the most important entry point to that was not to try to solve everything or be a political campaign or anything else. It was to build boxer briefs for women, okay? Because uh, that market wasn't there. And once they did that, they found that it wasn't just women. It was everybody who were like, hey, these are really fun, and we get to be whatever we want to do that. And they've since raised tons of money and actually are incredibly popular and growing like a weed and, you know, a real company with tons, attracting all kinds of designers who came out of the biggest parts of the fashion industry. And neither founder comes from the fashion industry, but because they had such a passion for this kind of reality, um, they were able to, to build the beginning of a really interesting business. So that's another sort of powers of the ABCs. Any questions before I keep going? Please interject. Okay, so you guys did another little survey. I thought it'd be interesting to look at some other examples and ask you about them. So uh, you sent in a bunch, you know, I asked you guys to all pick some Kickstarter or Indiegogo projects uh, and you know that you thought were interesting and attractive. And I just thought I'd highlight the kind of things that you picked. So a lot of home electronics, tools and hardware, consumer devices, uh, a little bit of clothing, health, etc. So all over the map in terms of categories of where you might see something that actually is maybe filling a need, okay? Um, what's interesting is you all have very, 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 very different opinions about what is filling a need. 73% uh, of you th th literally picked things for which there was no one else voted for the same thing. So li literally, like, there's there's 73% out of 100 people, there were 73 items that no one else picked, okay? So that's pretty interesting. So you all have very different ideas about what you want or what's missing. Uh, and a small number of you, like, yeah, so there's some who picked, uh, you know, more than one, you know, some items that got picked by more than one person, a few that got picked by three, very few that got picked by more than that. So that's pretty interesting that none of those ideas that are, quote, great ideas really came to the top, despite all the time, energy, and effort that Kickstarter does to try to make that work, um, uh, reached enough of you to go out as a groundswell across all of you. Um, it was interesting to see why you picked uh, you said there's a real need, address is a market need. I picked that. I think it's cool and niche. It solves a personal problem. Hmm. Solves a societal problem. So you have different reasons. You know, it's interesting how personal or not personal they are. But then I think it's actually interesting to look at the things that more than one of you picked and ask ourselves, are these actually things that could have an incredible vision or fill a huge gap or need? And these are the things that you, by the way, some of you picked um, things that were already completely funded uh, and already, so th they're not kind of in progress. So some, you, you pick some things that are a little different than the original idea. They're kind of already happened, so they're not necessarily new ideas yet. But here's some things. This is a t-shirt made out of recycled plastic and cinnamon. <laughs> so you don't have to wear deodorant anymore. Okay, how many, I mean, who voted for that? Anybody? Or you don't have to, why'd you vote for that? I thought it was awesome. <laughs> you thought it was awesome, so you have really bad body odor, but there's two people sitting next to you. No, I'm sorry, that was rude. Uh, okay, wow, a workout shirt and a regular shirt. We're going to come later to marketing and positioning. That's called a best of both worlds play. Very, very good. Okay, there's some sort of exercise board, something that you can go on that seems good, I guess. Um, Flash Forest, who voted for that? Anybody? Alexander, you already, I know you're an outdoorsy person, so you already asked. We're going to get, yes, Brian. Do you know, uh, do you know Alexandra? Yeah. Okay, I'm, that's fascinating, actually. Why did you vote for this? So, and, but there's a vision. So this to me is one that, where there's a vision that rises to a pretty high level, which is frankly, think about Australia right now. If I were a marketing person, I'd be focused on Australia trying to market this thing. Go look, if there were a lot more trees all over the place and you could not have to have armies of people. China, there's a whole effort in, in tree planting um, because of all the desert, desertification, uh, so interesting. 
this is a coffee grinder, a super high-tech coffee grinder. I think that's massively essential um, to have, you know, the exact perfect grind for your coffee before you make it. Anybody else here feel like that's absolutely critical? Yes? Good. All right. Uh, and then there's a finger bot. Uh, that's something. So anyway, you get the idea. There's some things that... <laughs> so what is essential and what's a big vision for one person may not be the same for another person. Uh, I did want to um, mention another quick thing. Uh, so there's sometimes a distance between vision and reality. Uh, so uh, this is just historically of Kickstarter projects. Uh, some, a significant percentage of them are actually frauds. Uh, never actually have, they get canceled or refunded because uh, no one actually ever intended to make whatever it was. Uh, there's a, a little bit more than that are real and got shipped in any given period of time. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole huge number that are, and I, I so I, I guess I should leave you with, someone asked what are the prizes going to be for the pitch contest? So I funded those, all those projects uh, yesterday and uh, the winners are going to win those projects uh, if they ever ship. So, uh, <laughs> and given that most of them are in production and I've been doing this for years now and I can tell you I have only given out about half of the prizes, but I do have a lot of emails with updates uh, on what's happening. So uh, again, vision is great and it's really good to have one, but it's reality is also <laughs> important. You have to actually have a practical vision that actually ships. A vision is not sufficient to making a company. So before I uh, hand it over to my guest speaker, uh, anybody know who this person is? Okay, everybody. That's, I'm very proud that we have a well-educated enough universe of people here who actually know this. That's great. Uh, great quote from him. Uh, and we know, you know, he, he lived this. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. So I just wanted that sentiment uh, to inform our, you know, kind of your mindset as you meet our next speaker, who both embodies incredible vision, incredible courage and innovation and new insights, and recognizing that sometimes it's a struggle and you have to actually learn from that struggle. So um, please give it up for Xiaoyu Wang, who is the founder and CEO of CastBox. Thank you, John, for having me here. Uh, today, I'm going to share my ABC with like uh, the, the uh, methodology that John just told, uh, share about my personal ABC and our product ABC as well as the company ABC. So basically, uh, this is my third year here in John's class sharing about my uh, experience, which is I feel very proud of that. Because on the way here, and John and me, we just talk about the percentage of the startup of fail within three years, which is about 60% of the company fail within the three years when they founded the company. So basically, as a company of four years old, you know, we are now like at least the top 40. So <laughs> among all the companies, you know, who have similar like history than us. So, Basically, so as I mentioned, I think like uh, I, I do learn a lot, I mean, uh, with John, and I think since the first and the second year when I just founded the startup, I met John, and John shared a lot of uh, his, like, uh, his vision and uh, his thought about the startup, and that, that's why I learned a lot of methodology from him and try to bring it into practice. And then I'm sharing the practice my practice with you guys, I want you to have like a better understanding with all the methodologies. So basically, I want to share my personal, uh, you know, ABC. Mm, about 15 years ago, I studied in Peking University with a major of psychology and statistics. So this is like a, a yes part, like A part, like yes, I'm studying in psychology. But I was thinking about to jump into the industri industry of internet and the mobile internet because it was a trending at that time, 15 years ago, the mobile internet is trending and I want to be involved and I want to be part of the trending. 
So that's why, uh, like uh, so, that's why I decided to learn my teach myself how to how to code. So at that time, as I mentioned, because my major was not computer science, if I learn some common programming languages, I can never win. You know. Com competing with all the students who are majored in, in computer science, who has this special specialties. So that's why I'm choosing one of the very special language, which is which was new about 15 years ago. I choose Android as my you know my first uh, learning uh, of the program languages because it was like just uh, Android was just acquired by Google about uh, like uh, I think two two years ago. I mean when I decided to learn Android, and every people was on the same page with these new languages, and then I learned myself how to teach uh, how to code Android and uh, develop uh, several games. You know, by by uh, by using Android and then launch my apps on on Google Play. So that was my first entry into the. I got my first tickets. Okay. How did you learn Android? Uh, so I just uh, basically uh, go to the Git GitHub. You know, there was tons of open source at that time, and uh, GitHub, and then go to the Stack Overflow to track with all the. <laughs> I know there's forty percent of engineering, so I assume those forty. Forty percent of students know about these two websites. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so and uh, and when I met problem, I just go to the Stack Overflow to check how other people you know deal with the problems. And then basically, I learn by doing. So I didn't read any book before I develop my, my first app. I just have my ideas of my first app, basically tracking my boyfriend where where he is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, I broke up with that boyfriend. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no, no. It's not a sad story. So, <laughs> so I was thinking about oh, where my boyfriend is. So that's why I think I want to develop an app called uh, Where He Is. So whenever I send her message, like a text message, including the keywords of Where Are You, and then he will automatically send me a message with his location of <laughs> yeah, his exactly location. <laughs> So that's why we, why we broke up. So, <laughs> so, so, but I mean, I have this idea first, and then I saw I, I search on GitHub. Is any you know any like kind of like uh, open source who are tracking the you know the GPS and uh, who are you know detecting the text, detecting the message you see, receive. And then I met some uh, when I have uh, some bugs and just uh, check how to solve it. So basically, this this is how I learn Android, and I put that app on go onto Google Play, and a lot of girls like it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's not work anymore. Uh, otherwise, I will share with your guys. So, and then uh, I get my ticket into the industry, and then I got a go uh, a job at Google. So, and uh, I used to work in Google Beijing and Dublin as well as in Tokyo to. Uh, have mobile developers, you know, to launch their app into into global uh, markets, and I get more. Uh, I I used to have four thousand developers, you know, to try to monetize their apps in a global scale. So that's why I get more insights into the industry. So that's about uh, I think about four years ago, I decided to quit my job at Google Japan and founded Castbox. So this 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 is my personal ABC. I always has a current situation, and I have a future goal for my personal development. And I find the solutions, find uh, like uh, like the the best uh, or the easiest way, you know, to to reach to my to my personal future goal. And this is uh, like the beginning of the the startup. So at at that time, I was in Japan, and I I asked one of my friends to. Mm, I asked one of my friend to rent a house in he, in China, and then he. This is what my friend showed me. Uh, at that time, I was in Japan, and he showed me. Oh, this is the the the, the office I rent for you, and I didn't realize that he's showed me the demo picture. So that's why <laughs> when I get out from the the plan and I get get out from the. Uh, the plan, and I just go directly to the office, and I saw the real, real, of, real, real place. But uh, anyway, I accept that and try to, you know, work hard to, 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 <laughs> to solve this problem, uh, solve this problem, and try to make the company growing better and uh, into a better situation. 
So that's why we oh, begin. Hold on. So yeah. you, you literally got off the plane yeah. in Tokyo, going to your beautiful new yeah. office, and this is what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it was here. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the laptop. So it's, yeah. <laughs> it's better. So <laughs> but the, the funny part is that it's very, very funny because this part there was no, it was winter. But there was no heat in the room because it's still under decoration, and uh, there was no water in the bathroom, so it's terrible. So <laughs> when people can in the afternoon, so in the morning it's better. So and then in the afternoon it's getting worse, and then uh, there was a very funny story because every time uh, because it was only me at the very beginning, so I have to code until two two or three a.m. every every day and every time when I get off the building there was a gate there are gatekeeper they will lock the gate and then I have to wake him up to open the gate for me <laughs> and uh, every time and then I get out of the, the the campus and the guy said oh it's so hard to make him money no nowadays so I was thought he was talking about me you know a young not young anymore but a <laughs> young lady go home so late every every midnight but after one month he quit his job so I thought, oh, he's talking about himself, you know, <laughs> as a gatekeeper, not making a lot of money, but has to be wake up by me every day. So I feel so sorry for him, but I, anyway, I didn't give up. So, so from this humble beginning, from myself, and then nowadays we have like uh, more than 80 people based uh, in Palo Alto, Los Angeles. Uh, we have one more people in New Jersey, Seoul, Beijing, and then we just long, uh, open a new office uh, at the end of last year in Manila. So, and also beyond the- Do those offices have running water? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is the number one requirements when we're looking for a new office. So, <laughs> because it was terrible. <laughs> and uh, so every time we go to the office, we say, oh, do you have water in the, in the restroom? So, <laughs> and then beyond that, we have uh, 100 ambassadors, you know, from Brazil, from India, from different kind of countries to try to help us to run, run the business. Yeah, and then we have like a, a lot of more like, uh, 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 you know, really talented team members, you know, people with better, you know, better skills or better intelligence than me, you know, to work together. So this is like uh, my personal ABC uh, and my personal journey until today. And then I will share about CastBox, you know, as a product. I want to share the ABC of this product. So basically, CastBox, uh, we, are, uh, we are a global audio platform that enable anyone to easily find, access, create, and enjoy all spoken audio content. So when we, uh, when we first uh, launched CastBox, there was ton, you know, tons of other uh, apps you know, who are focusing on spoken audio. And uh, then, as I mentioned, there are many audio apps with similar content and uh, distribution channels. But our future is like, uh, uh, we want to build something really, you know, modernized and personalized because none of them, you know, could fulfill the personalized and modernized and the rapidly growing needs of the audio revolution. So uh, we wanted to create something, you know, really uh, fancy and building, building something really easy to use and relevant and make people connected with the information. So this is like how the CastBox vision came from to be the heart of the audio, uh, spoken audio revolution. And uh, combined with that, our mission is try to connect people to information through listening whenever and wherever they want. So that is, that is at the very beginning why, what the situation we are facing, what's the future you know, we are looking for, and how we try to solve that. But at the very beginning, before like we go through, you know, before as, as the first day of go to our vision mission is try to find the market fit. So at the very beginning, we didn't have like CastBox across all pr platform. We have only CastBox for Android. Because at that time, we noticed that iTunes podcast already has 10 million daily active users, but they are only served on iOS. But for Android, there was no pre-installed apps that can fit the similar needs. So that's why with the, the first version of CastBox, we only support Android. And when people move their, you know, try to change their iPhone to Android phone, they are looking for similar apps. And then we make sure that they find CastBox. We did a lot of ASO and uh, ICO as well as, you know, paid user acquisition, try to position CastBox as an Android version of podcast 
especially for the users who just moved uh, you know, from iPhone to, to Android phone. So this was the early days. It made us grow really quickly by fitting the, the marketing, the marketing uh, blanket. And after a while, when, uh, after about three years later, when there are more and more apps, podcast app came out, after Google has their own podcast app, and after like a lot of uh, new VC-based uh, you know, uh, podcast players that try to be stronger and stronger, we try to redefine the market. Uh, so there are like, try to, we try to build some different differentiations and try to make Caspers unique. For example, we have like in audio search, which we are the only and the first uh, uh, app who, who, has, who support this in audio search. Now I think all Google and uh, Apple, they also try to learn from this feature. And also we try to build a community, try to make a podcast not only a, like a, only on entries, but based on the topics of the podcast, they can talk a lot more. And also we try to build a, like a live cast, which is means that within Castbox, there are one stop solution. You can by one click to launch your live show and interact with your listeners. And the people can donate you by sending virtual gift. And after the show, all the audio you are making during the conversation, you, uh, basically you can also answer answering phone calls. And all the conversations between the, between the the whole, uh, the whole live show will be recorded and you can publish them again as a podcast. So this is all the very unique and, uh, uh, and creative ideas from CastBox. So this is why we got a lot of uh, recognition from the industry. So I can share this one. So I need your help. Yeah. Well, no I can't hear, I don't know why you can't hear it. Yeah. So basically, this is Dr. Phil. He said he, how He's, he loves wow. us. <laughs> yeah. So. Who's listening? Does anybody use a podcast? How many people listen to my podcast? What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, now yeah. open your. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically, this. <laughs> like I don't look like Dr. Phil, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> okay, not, not too much. I yeah. So basically, we spend zero dollars on this. On this, like, uh, uh, like, uh, on this one, because basically it, it. Can I turn him off now? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> so basically, it will sp spend about one million or two million US dollars to to show uh, to put ads on his show. But basically, we spend zero because, as I mentioned, we have some unique. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. So. So b because we have a lot of unique features, as I mentioned, and it make us unique, make other this influencer want to work with us. So they, it was like the, the ideas who bring Caspers into today. Um, but uh, go to the next level, you know, we are asking ourselves what's next as a company and what's the new ABC for the company to get better. So there was a book, you know, uh, by Reid Hoffman, uh, Bleed Scaling. In this book, they are talking about that for a company, sometimes for a bleeding scaling, uh, bleed scaling company, we prioritized the, the speed over efficiency, in, even in uncer uh, uncertain, uh, uncertain uh, like time. So, but I'm thinking when we bring this idea back to Castbox, we are asking ourselves whether or not, uh, you know, we are we are good for this kind of fleet scaling. We raised about 30 million US dollars during the first two years. And uh, when we raised those money, those investors really want to us, you know, in this kind of like a fast speed growth. But when we look into the podcast industry, it's not uh, that fast than the investors expect. So it's really make us frustrating. It's a good business, business but it's not a, a fast business. So that's why we began to rethink uh, how we should position Caspers, how we should position the company. So as I mentioned, uh, Caspers is already number one on third party uh, pure play podcast app. And, then, and also Caspers already generated enough cash flow. So as I mentioned, after the 30 million US dollars uh, funding, we didn't need uh, any more money because we already cash, uh, cash, flow over, cash overflow positive. But uh, the customer is not growing as fast as the first two years. And also, I do not think uh, we should follow the blazing scale. We should spend the money in higher speed in, instead of you know, efficient, efficiently. And, uh, and the most important, 
I think we must survive in a in those days in a tougher investment environment, as well as find our next growth engine. If can as a can you pause on that for just yeah. a second and tell us what changed, right? So you yeah you grew from how many users are on Castbox now? Uh, thirty million. Thirty million users. Yeah. So that's in how long? You had uh, thirty million by how long? Uh, three years. In the in first three, three years, years. You went from zero to thirty million. Yeah. Um, and in a normal like externally in the sort of venture capital world, it's like keep growing users, yeah. scale faster, yeah. scale faster. Uh, but what happened to make you question that? Yeah, because I mean, as a first, uh, because it's easier when we are smaller, we can grow really fast. Every year we have over one hundred percent of growth rate. But since the third year, because we already reach a, a kind of like a user base, it's really hard to grow at the same speed. Yep. And even though we spent uh, tons of money, I think uh, last year we spent about uh, five million US dollars only on user acquisition. But uh, if we s even we spent more money on user acquisition because the market size of this kind of podcast uh, listeners are, are not like growing as quickly as one hundred percent every year. So the more money we spend, the lower efficiency we can use the money. So it's kind of like even we continually to you know persuade the investors to invest, uh, we cannot deliver the the result they want. This is first one. The second one is that uh, the majority of the money we get are from the Chinese investors, and there's like some deep big, biggest market change during the since the end of 2018 because there are a lot of like public company go, went into the bad situation. So people are more uh, conservative with you know investment. So the investment made last year is kind of only one tenth of the money they spent two years ago. So not only ourselves, but the whole investment is also get investment environment is also getting slowed down. So this is like uh, bo both internal and external. I don't think it's uh, really wise to continually spend stupid money to <laughs> to attract like kind of like data like but uh, it's not like uh, the stable data. Yeah. So you did not want to go down the WeWork strategy um, of just spending more and more money until assuming you will always get more money. Yeah, because I think SoftBank are getting more and more clear, uh, clever with <laughs> with the yeah. investment. So yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and also I think there's like uh, if you see there's um, there's a lot of company I think since 2015 because it's really p optimistic with all the investors. But now I think people get more like uh, down to the earth with what's real happening, if the company, if the business unit can make money. So this is what they are looking for. Even if you see the, the soft bank, the uh, Sun, like uh, President Sun, they, he mentioned that before, Every, every speech when he delivered to his LP, he mentioned about, oh, the company, we should achieve for the highest speed, highest growth rate. But uh, during the, I think the, the last quarter when he delivered speech, he said that the company, every company, every single uh, company they invest should, uh, you know, looking for profitable. So they are changing as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think, like, uh, as you know, as well as the start having the company, we we, re we really want to survive, and uh, we really want to find our next growth engine. So we want to build a real business that cash flow positive and get more and more profitable. So this is like the new ABC for the company, and uh, we want to down to the earth. We want to make sure, you know, make sure that uh, we want to survive before. You know, before all, before we are out of cash. So that's based on the new ABC. We redefine our found, uh, found, uh, our foundation of decision making philosophy. So this is uh, uh, this is like the the speech when during the at the end of 2019 internally to the team, and this is I shared with the team how we should think of the uh, think of the. Uh, how should how should we make decisions? And uh, we want all the team members on the same page, and we align each other. First of all, we want to make all the decision based on the long term. So actually, because I mean before, you know, when the VC based company is kind of like a, a, a growing game. You grow, reach a number, get more VC dollars, and then you grow using the money you spend. Uh, 
another like uh, marketing, spend more time on marketing, on you know building the team, and then you grow to another number, then you know and some an, another VC round. So it was a story before, but I don't think it's kind of like. Uh, it, it the story may may not last uh, l for longer during the, this year, and so we should think about uh, like uh, more long term instead of short term. And the second one is that doing things with higher base rate. So basically, this is kind of like methodology. If you read the book of thinking fast and slow, this is mentioned that when you do things, always think uh, about the base rate. Does so anybody know what that means? What the base rate means? You have engineers and. What, you, what does this phrase mean? So I can tell Please. an example. <laughs> so there's like um, no cookies for you. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I can share an example uh, within the book. They say that um, there's two chance. First, uh, there's two situation. First of all, if you go to the New uh, New York subway, and you you are there's one people who are reading the book, so you can decide. How how many uh, how much chance he or she uh, is a you know kind of like has a better degree? This is one situation. The second situation is you go to the Stanford or go to the UW campus. You know you see some people who are not reading a book, just you know hanging out. But uh, how many uh, percentage you know he or she can may have a bachelor degree? So even though the people who are reading. On the on the New York subway, but uh, there are still less chance for him or she, or she to have a better degree compared to the people who are not reading, you know, in the UW campus, because the base rate of uh, people, you know, in the New York subway has a degree has a better degree is much lower than uh, people, you know, in this UW campus to to hold a bachelor degree. You know, so this is like kind of like it means that you should always make a decision based on the base rate. If the base rate is much higher, they are more likely. If you uh, you know make the decision based on the base rate, you it's more likely to have like the the chance to be successful. So there's that. In, in a way, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but are you in a way isn't this sort of saying, don't do the work, figure out. What's the hardest thing to do, and don't do that. That's true. And out what the, so based on the probability of the target audience you're going after, the probability of success, only work on things where the prob the lowest sort of basic probability, that without a lot of assumption. Yeah, exactly. It gives you a higher chance of success. Yeah. Don't jump. Even all the vision and everything else. Don't just dream. That's Try true. To Based things on reality. Yeah. So, on the way here, John and us uh, and me talk about a situation about the social social influencers. We saw a lot of people become very you know powerful in social network as a being a social influencer, even without a special expertise or with special you know uh, special talent. But if you if we want to be a you know be successful in social influencer, it's very likely you know it's very small chance we can be in that kind of person so if we spend all our time all our efforts on doing that it may waste a lot of efforts because like we cannot back on our futures based on the lucky so if we, we say that, oh if i'm lucky enough i can be successful then it will be really a bad decision so always try to do things you know with a higher base rate which means that you can be more likely to be successful and uh, it makes your your life easier, and do not bet on on how luck you can be. And the third one of the found foundation of our decision making is focusing on the essence and make the judgment by using common sense. So before before we try to make the company more down to earth, all our all our thought is try to say that oh, if there's maybe something you know, uh, may, maybe something really really good happened to us. And we we all think the things in from the positive positive side, but uh, some time time for example like Casper's maybe it's not a, a kind of like industry that growing so quickly. So, but if we think down to earth, oh, how is the industry really look like? Maybe as I mentioned, maybe it's not a, a bad business, but it's not a good uh, like a fast uh, fast industry. So maybe we try to back things. If this is a slow industry, if this is a good industry, how we can spend the money, you know, more like efficient. So this is like 
the foundation of our decision making philosophy. So this is based on the philosophy. We try to re resize the company and we try to reposition the company. We used to be only focusing on audio and on spoken audio. Now we try to build a kind of like an app factory. And in the middle, we try to build a middleware and try to support all the other other features, all the other apps, all the, all, all the other business units. And uh, we grow six more business units. And for every single unit, we want to make it profitable. We want to make it like uh, successful. And this is all the apps we developed during the past one year, and including Police Scanner, including a Cuddle, which is a live, app, li uh, live streaming app, including a podcast player, including some other games, and in including a blockchain project. So this is like try to uh, redefine the company from like an audio platform into a content entertainment platform through kind of like utility tool into a content providers. So this is like how we redefine the company. And then, the, and then this is our outlook for the future. First of all, is try to drive towards the profitability in each and every business we are in. So we try to make the very, very specific uh, uh, data analysis and uh, forecast with every single unit and every single product. And the second one is try to enhance the middleware as a long-term engine. So when I'm talking about the middleware, it's try to say that in, in every different kind of apps, they should they have engineers to build that app. But there are some certain elements we can put into the middleware, including user acquisition, including monetization, including business intelligence, including some like a kind of like a common API, like login, like a kind of like a game center. We try to like centralize the, all the middleware and try to provide the pow power and all the other product team. Can I interject yeah. just one thing for a second? So one of the things you may hear from me, but as a venture capitalist, one of the things that we talked about a lot was knowing the difference between a feature, a product, and a company. And you want to invest in something that can actually be a company. And sometimes people get very excited about developing some little thing, and it doesn't have to be a traditional product. They're really, really excited to solve a single problem, but that's not a full-fledged product that somebody really is motivated enough to buy. But then what, and you built a product that motivated 30 million people to buy, right? That's pretty good. But the really big thing is, mo and most companies don't get to do that. But then an even smaller number of companies get to go to the next phase where they realize, well, we have to graduate from that to actually being a company that can sustain itself and can continue to grow. And, and I think that's a big part of what you've done is start investing in the things that regardless of the, how good or bad an investment market it is out there, you can continue to be a good company yeah. and grow. Yeah, exactly. So, for example, like um, I take the police scanner and uh, like the the for example, we developed the police scanner since uh, last quarter. But until today, within three months, we already uh, exact operation cost. I mean, only we taking taking care of the user acquisition cost compared to the revenue we made is already cash cash flow over a uh, cash overflow positive. So this is like there's several reasons. First of all, as I mentioned, we have middleware, which can support this, this kind of product can grow very quickly. The second one is because we are really focusing on trying to make single business profitable. And this is like we do all the math based on, on the data. So this is like how we make it. And the third one, and which is also very important, is try to build a Catrice leadership and be ready for the tipping point. Because I think maybe in like within two or three years, when the 5G came, there will be tons of new opportunity came out. And we want to be ready for that. When the opportunity came, we want to catch that. But before that, we, make, we want to make sure we are stronger enough. So this is like uh, the, the how we build the, the leadership team. Actually, this was like a, a methodology by Mao, like President Mao, Mao Zedong, you know, one of the greatest president of China. And when, when he's talking about uh, building the leadership, uh, building the categories, he gave five like, uh, ideas. First, it gave them guidance, you know, gave them free and uh, freedom to, to, to lead the product, to, to lead the, the business unit. Second one is try to raise their level, try to teach them how to be better, 
tell them the methodology as well as uh, the, the thinking philosophy. The third one is continually to review, review their work and then and try to give them feedback, help them to uh, enhance the, the good part and try to solve the bad part. The fourth one is try to correct their mistake and try to make persuade them, you know, try to be a, be a better version of themselves. And the fifth, uh, but the, the last but not least, is support them in real life, make sure they are I, you know, living a happy life. So this is like the five items that we learned from some other, you know, some other people, some, some other like people, how they think about, uh, of, you know, improving the leadership. So this is like the, the, the last thing we are doing. So the company, now we are, during the past one year, we try to build the new culture. And uh, as I mentioned, the, we are st still a startup company. The strategy for startup is getting things done. And the culture for real startup, startup should get dirty things done. And um, the personal development in a startup, which I share with the team, that if the startup is growing, if the product is growing, everyone on the boat is growing. So actually, this is also the three takeaways for, for today, my sharing. Because I think as a startup, we are kind of an entry level of, of the company. We are a kind of junior level of, of company. But if the students here, when you just uh, go into the society, join into a, a working environment, you are kind of a junior level of like a new environment. So I think for the strategy of being new, new fresh, new B, is like try to get things done. And the best attitude is try to get dirty things done. And also, so if you can continually to deliver result, continue, continue to make things happen, your personal career development will be, you know, will also be achieved. So that's it, that is also my, my main takeaways for all of you. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question yeah. before you do? Yeah. Uh, so where do you live now? Uh, it's like, oh uh, yeah, I, I still live in the office. So <laughs> <laughs> let's say four years later, she still lives in that same office. Yeah. Uh, how much uh, customer support do you personally do? Um, a lot. Because, for example, I take this, for example, um, like Cuddle, when it's first launched, so I'm, the, I'm the, the one who are running help desk. So it's very funny because, you know, my English is not good. So when, every time when I'm running the help desk, the, the user will complain, oh, you, 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 your company should fire you and uh, <laughs> hire a, a better client service. You know? <laughs> or like, I think, okay, if I'm fired, who will pay the salary for all the <laughs> other people? So, so this is like, but still I spend a lot of time uh, with like user support because this is the best, the only way we can make the product better. Yeah. yeah, so I just want to highlight that, yeah. that methodology you talked about. You do real work. Yeah. You're not afraid of getting things really done. Yeah. And I've been in meetings with you where you literally are on, you are taking customer support. Yeah. Right, I mean, as CEO of a company, you're never losing touch with what's really going on. Yeah. You're, uh, you know, soldiering along with everybody else. So as yeah. a leader, no one, no one ever thinks, there's no job in the company yeah. that you're not willing to do. Yeah, because I think as a startup, we have only, like an uh, internet company, uh, like uh, we have only two assets. First is uh, the employees of the company, the team members of the company. The second uh, asset we have is the users. So the only way that uh, the company can be successful is try to, tr you know, really like serve the users better. So this is the only way that a startup can survive. Okay. Questions yeah. from you guys? Yeah. Uh, Couple yeah. questions. Yeah. What's your revenue model? Are you planning to raise any more funding and what's your exit strategy? Uh, yeah. So a business model is quite different among different apps. Uh, like for Cuddle, the majority revenue came from the tipping because there's a lot of like a virtual gift inside the app and when people feel give like it. yeah give the gift like virtual gifts and uh, people can spend money to buy the gifts and then try to deliver the gift send the gift to the host mm -hmm. and uh, this is from e uh, IAP we call it in I purchase and the police scanner is kind of like a subscription model because uh, we are the only uh, the, the the only one of the the two uh, p platforms that who has this kind of like the police scanner uh, results. So a lot of people are really want to eager to listen, want to listen what's happening. Like 
Like in Australia. Yeah, yeah, like there was a big fire in Australia and there was the most updated uh, information is only in the in the police scanner, in, in the walkie talkie of the police. A lot of people want to to know what's happening. So people will spend about thirty US dollars per year by subscribing uh, the services. And uh, and for for Casper, so we have like uh, several different uh, business models as well. We have like a lot of podcasts will pay us to promote their content. It's kind of like more like ads, ads like uh, advertisement. We call it direct sales, direct ads. And also we have like uh, uh, ads network who provide different kind of like uh, like uh, like from Google, or Facebook, or like uh, ads net network to provide us like uh, ads. And uh, and uh, yeah, so this is like quite a different amount of apps. And uh, for new money, uh, actually we are quite uh, like positive with the uh, cash overflow, and we still have money in bank account. And for every month, we are generate new monies. And we may consider acquire other companies within this year or next. I mean, we we have several targeting targeted uh, companies we want to acquire, but we want to be like slow down. <laughs> instead of uh, instead of uh, too aggressive, and in the at the end of the day, I think there are several uh, um, I mean several ways to uh, exit. Like IPO is definitely one way, because if we continually to ge generate more revenue and there is more net margin, you know, regardless the uh, the PS or PE is higher or lower, we can still have the possibility to to go IPO. Can I just interject based yeah. on our conversation? I mean, I think one of the things, I think it's an exciting thing to talk about. The last several years, and this happens cyclically, you know, that there's a lot of companies who go public based on um, the, the promise of something happening in the future. Yeah. But the price of a company, if anybody here is an economist or a finance person, is actually based, it's a discounted percentage of anticipated future dividends paid to shareholders. You cannot pay dividends unless you make profit. So you are now moving and decided to build a real company that actually makes money, and one day you you know, people will pay you for that yeah. as investors one way or the other. So I just highlight that. That's a and, and that's a pretty survivable strategy no matter mm. what happens in the market. So other questions? So uh, Zach. Um can we talk about like uh, what your approach was to make sure that the base rate was adequate before you switched to uh, the middleware uh, business model? You, you mean it's the approach from? Did, did you like do some data like uh, analysis? Did you talk to your user base? How did you know that uh, going to this middleware centric? Yeah, how did you figure out the base rate for each one of these decisions? Yeah, so basically uh, I just shared with John today <laughs> with how we make a decision whether or not we will go into a new business. So. Uh, for every single one, we have like a, we have we make decision based on three steps. First of all, we will see whether or not there are existing apps who are doing similar things, and uh, how how they are doing. I mean, for example, like for Cuddle, we we notice that there are several kind of like live audio streaming apps who are doing extremely well in Korea, in Middle East, in China, or make a or make about 100 million US dollars or to 300 million US dollars per year for, for annual uh, run rate. And this, this is like the ceiling we can achieve if you are doing similar things in the US market. Uh, the second one, we will say that whether or not, uh, I mean, how, how big the team is. For example, if this is like a really good thing, but the, the, the resource behind that thing is huge, which is impossible for us, like a video live streaming. If you see all the other video live streaming, they need at least uh, 200 million US dollars investment until you make the, make the market share, which we do not have that money. So we will uh, be try to be avoid of that, that kind of thing. And the third thing, the third one we were saying that how do they make it happen? You know, what is, uh, what is uh, like, what they are doing good in user acquisition, in product, uh, and in monetization, and how we can learn from them, but, and how we can be different with them. So this is like uh, from a single product into uh, multi, multi apps. We always try to, try to see these three aspects. And uh, for the middleware level, as I mentioned, we try to um, abstract uh, the, the, uh, the ability to build an app. 
and which as which ability we can you know we can centralize into the middleware and no need for the product team to do that again and again and to learn that again. So this is how we decide we put the the whether or not we put this kind of like uh, ability into the product team or into the middleware team. There's another comment I want to make before uh, just something you went through very quickly. So we're talking about inspiration, and I think especially for American audiences, I think it's really important to learn from one of the things you've done, which is learn from every country. Ideas, this is not the sole source of great ideas. This country is not the only place. Whether it's China or Saudi Arabia or Korea or, I mean, literally you have been looking and open to getting inspiration for ideas from everywhere else. And I just think that's something, if, you're, if you like an industry and you're involved in it, don't just look at your nearest neighbors. Look everywhere to see where sources of innovation are. And yeah. I think that's something you've done really, really well. Yeah, I think it's very important to be humble. So because, I mean, if you s because as I mentioned, when I, um, I'm luckily enough, I work for Google and I work, basically I used to support like, uh, as I mentioned, 400, uh, uh, 4,000, uh, I'm sorry, 4,000 developers and they are from all over the world. I can see that, I mean, there's a lot of like developers in different countries, they are really talented and really smart and they do a, doing a really great job in certain markets. And most likely after two or three years, you know, this like uh, best practice in certain country that would be play again <laughs> in some other country. So it's kind of like, I think overall, no matter where the user came from, they have similar, ne similar needs because we are all human beings. We have a similar kind of like, we, we want to be, be appreciated. We want to be treated better. We want to, you know, to be kind of like, uh, to link with others or connect with others. I mean, the, based on the, like, I mean, no matter where they're from. So that's why, as I, as I mentioned, uh, you know, whenever there's something happening in certain country, you can always think, oh, why, 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 why this happened? And how we can, you know, learn from those practice to make it, uh, you know, make it like happen in some other country. Okay, any other questions? I think maybe we can take one or two more questions. Yeah. So you've uh, obviously dealt with many different parts of the growth phase. I'm very curious if you would expand more on the very beginning. How did you go about like tackling the chicken and egg problem of uh, finding and harnessing a community of podcasters and also finding and harnessing a community of listeners and like that process in general? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so basically I think uh, because I didn't spend too much time on castbox for uh, for castbox, I mean this is like uh, uh, we, at the very beginning I think we really think very hard to make castbox you know work. So um, there was several process we, we, we built castbox. The first version of castbox actually was built by myself. Uh, it take about it took about four days, you know from this idea until I put it on Google Play. I think, um, I think at the end of like uh, 2015, I have the idea. And I, I used to have, have some needs, personal needs uh, with uh, spoken audio, but uh, I do not know which to entry. And there was one guy from Google Play, and he talked to <coughs> me, me, said, oh, he said, uh, there's really good needs for, for Google Play with this kind of podcast player, because a lot of people are searching for that, but uh, no one is building that. And he talked uh, this, his idea with tons of people before me, but I'm the one who make it happen. <laughs> so I, I, he talked to me at the end, I think December, se December 31st uh, of 2015. I said, I thought that, oh, this is a good idea, good, uh, good action. So I began to build on, on January 1st of 2016, and I make it happen within three, actually three days and put it alive on January 4th. So, yeah, and uh, the first version was only built based on open source, which is MT MIT license, which is, you know, uh, you know f um, kind of like, it, it's legal. So because MIT license is commercial friendly. So I just find a, a open source <coughs> app on GitHub with, with good license, and uh, I just uh, rebuild this app. And uh, <laughs> there was one thing very, uh, a little bit funny, because I forgot to change the contact email. <laughs> so <laughs> every support email <laughs> go to that original, e original email. So that guy contacted me and said, please change the email. <laughs> I don't want to receive anymore. <laughs> so 
And the first, what, what did I do during the first three days? I want to share uh, because the original one uh, is kind of like based built with a kind of like very very technical person, a geek person, and uh, all the ranking of the app uh, at that time was kind of like uh, like uh, Linux development, uh, like tech talk, but for tech. It's all like a tech specific. So all the podcasts were about yeah. Linux development. Yeah, 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 and the Linux development yeah. or like technology or like a trending of of the 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 like AI or something like that. <coughs> I make that uh, the first one is kind of like um, I, I remember the first one is Joe Rogan. <laughs> the, <laughs> the second one is like kind of like uh, like uh, I remember it's NPR uh, or something like that. I I just put the. I mean the the content ranking from a tech specific into a real human specific, <laughs> like a kind of like a more more common like needs. This is the first thing I'm doing. The second thing I'm doing during the that three days, I make it globalized. So at the very beginning, there was only English, and I change into the like seventy languages supported. So the first version of Caspers we support seventy language, and what we are doing different not only the language, but for the ranking of different countries are different. For example, if you are, even you are using English, if you are go to the UK, you will see BBC as a number one. If you are the US, you will see like a, like. A, you know some like uh, AOL, you know for 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 the top news, and if us from Australia, you will see some Australia local news. And also what uh, what I did like for the third one is that I make the user interface much better looking. So it's like not a, like a very like kind of like a dark mode, but kind of make it more like user friendly. So this is first step. And uh, uh, we are doing, but at the very beginning, we do not have very big uh, like uh, library, content library, as you mentioned, the podcasters, the user needs. So the second one, we try to uh, try to fulfill the content. Is that uh, at that time we are using the iTunes API for getting the content, but iTunes I API they have limitation of one hundred top only they only show top one hundred content for each category. There are there was about sixteen category, so we have very limited content. But then we find that oh, people will leave. The retention is not good because people cannot find the content. So that's why we are trying to using a way to search for. The, but but if we crawl the whole internet, it will spend a lot of money, which is not affordable by a startup. So what we are doing is, try, is that whenever a user search keywords on Castbox, we are using the keywords to search on all the other platform <laughs> to try to compare the result. So if you search one key, one one keywords on Castbox, if you didn't have the result, no worry, you will search again, it will show. So we try to by by this kind of thing, by building this kind of like uh, compare the searching result, we make Castbox library bigger and bigger. So even today, we have like about six. We, I think uh, uh, iTunes have have about five hundred thousand channels today. And Spotify has two hundred thousand channels, and Castbox we have seven hundred thousand channels, which is almost the most uh, like uh, biggest library among all the podcast players. And uh, so that's why if you see our Google review on Cas uh, uh, podcast, our app review on Google Play or Apple Store, people will say that oh, we can f no matter what we want look, I can find you. The third one is that we uh, we are doing on. Uh, on, on Castbox, make it better. Is that we notice that there are several kind of like uh, channels that update very quickly. For example, if uh, you book both subscribe NPR News on Castbox or on iTunes, you will notice that every one hour when the NPR News you know updated, we will send you a push notification. But after about one and a half hours, uh, iTunes will send you a push notification because they notice that. Uh, there was new content. Why we can do really quickly? Because we using every user as a as a hub. So every time when they open their app, open their channel, and they ping the server, and we understand, oh, there was a new new update, and we notice that, and then we put to all the other users. So it's kind of like we make every single user as a decentralized hub. So this is like the third step. We try to 
build the cast walls more user-friendly by providing the most updated content. And this is for the user part, how we make it different. For podcasters, similar. And there's, I don't want to share more detail to waste people's time, but uh, it's similar. We try to, every time when we build something, we try to think if there is a better way, how we can be more like, uh, like what the users really want, how we can solve the problem. So as far as we continually to do that, and the app continually to, to fit the user's need and getting better. So I hate to end this because yeah. we could talk for a really long time. Uh, I want to thank you again for coming all the way from Beijing today uh, to come <laughs> and speak. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, again, I just want to you know express again like this is just these are really fundamental lessons of it, some of it is just hard work, right? Like listening hard to customers fixing things all the time. I mean, one of the things I view uh, shall use whole company, not just Castbox, but that middleware comes from a culture of saying they almost you don't almost don't see the difference between the product and the relationship with the customer. They're just fixing it and changing it by listening all the time. And you as the CEO live that in your own life. And so I think that it just kind of shows the high level, uh, you know, vision and all that strategy, but also this really down to earth questions, but with some layup to start with. So, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Roshni. I'm the Dempsey co chair. Um, so, to get started off, let's just have a brief introduction from our panelists to just share their name, the name of their company. Um, which year they participated in the competition, as well as um, a brief overview of their company as well. And be really brief in your overview of the yeah, company. Yeah, keep it on two minutes. I can start. Um, my name is Randolph Lopez. Um, I participated in the 2018 Healthcare Innovation Challenge and the uh, Business Plan Competition. And the name of our project now company is Alpha Bio, where we basically took a technology from the bioengineering department here at UW license it and turn it into a drug discovering engine to better biologics in cancer and infectious disease. Hi, I'm Susan Tai, and my company is Fan20 Delivery, and it is the best Asian food delivery in North America right now. And um, I participate in 2017 BPC. Hi, everyone. I'm Harrison. Um, Electrosolar Oxygen was my senior year design project. Um, from the chemical engineering department, and we try to create a on-site oxygen generator for rural f medical facilities in Africa. Hi, is this? It, it's on. Okay. Um, my name is Jenny Steger, and I'm a pharmacology PhD student here at the University of Washington. My company is Nanodropper, and we're making a universal adapter for prescription eye drop bottles that reduces the volume of oversized drops to save patients a lot of money. Um, and we participated in the Health Innovation Challenge and the Business Plan Competition in 2018 and 2019. That's it. Okay. So can you guys briefly describe like your vision for your company and what really inspired you to do this? I can start. Um, yeah, I think both me and my co-founder have always been interested on in using technology specifically biotech to improve people's lives. And we both had our PhD here at UW, and it was really hard to sometimes see the connection between the work that we're doing in the lab and how we're helping people. Um, I think that was a drive be behind taking a technology and really putting it into the marketplace. It's just how can we take this amazing research that we're doing here at UW and actually build better drugs that are going to help people. Um, our company, uh, Fenton, and we have a lot of like uh, Asians in the United States, and we focus on the food delivery right now. But we want to build our app as a one-stop, like for life service app for all the Asians and expand it to other local Americans. Um, we heard a personal recount from one of our professors, and she was helping out in um, Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria hit, and. Um, she realized that oxygen insecurity was one of the major problems there, and primarily because medical oxygen was transported using oxygen cylinders, which are both expensive and unre unreliable. And we wanted to see if we can try to create a product that would be able to 
be implemented in these developing countries that would only be able to that would be able to create medical oxygen using just sunlight, water, and air, offering a very cheap and sustainable alternative. So the inspiration for NanoDropper was actually an NPR article that came out in October of 2017, um, and it's called "Drug Companies Make Eye Drops Too Big and You Pay for the Waste," and it basically describes this problem that we're trying to solve. And one of my co-founders read this article and was just completely infuriated and realized that she had all of the resources to solve this problem. So that's what we did. Okay. Um, so did any of you guys have any prior business um, experience before entering the competition? And really, like, what got you into the competition? How did you get started? Uh, yeah, anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I can start. Sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, basically, my startup experience starts from BPC, and last year when I, was, when I sat here, and I'm the CEO of Yamsu Inc. And after two months, we got acquired by Fenton Delivery. It's a good acquisition. And right now, we we after the acquire acquisition, we launched Fenton in Seattle, and now we have more than 10,000 users in Seattle. And we launched in LA and in New York City too. And we are closing the a new round of fundraising of more than 10 million. This pretty quick, pretty soon. And yeah, that's sure. Um, my formal business experience was restricted to just um, accounting 215. <laughs> uh, um, and I wanted to take finance 350, but unfortunately, it wasn't open to non-business majors as an undergrad. Um, but other than that, I just did one case competition, and that's it. I had no formal business experience or education before NanoDropper. Why did they like it? Okay, sure. So, can you like share a little bit about your um, experience participating in the competition? Like, what was your biggest takeaway, and what we really enjoyed in the process of it? Um, I think for us, what was really useful was less a competition and more the training for the competition. I look at the competition as an excuse to really focus yourself and have like a shiny object at the end. But what we got the most out of it were all the relationships we built that kind of help us shape our business model, help our fundraising strategy. Um, I think it's different from any class that you would take because you get a lot more interaction and you have all these people that are not only in the room that they have the competition, but beforehand. And you can reach out to them. You can have you know, 30 minutes, reach out to them on LinkedIn. And with the excuse of the competition, they'll set up a meeting with you, and you can learn a lot. So I think that all those relationships are what I remember the most. Yeah, yeah um, for me, uh, I met the, uh, I, I built a team from the BBC, and they even along the, the road, and they still support me. And uh, also, I met my advisor, John. And uh, he gave me really a lot of uh, um, advices about uh, the business. From first, so we build the business, and then about the acquisition, and about how we uh, have the new strategy for the new new business in Seattle. So I think the the connections and the experiences is really important to to me. Yeah, um, I think other than the um, prize money that you could potentially win to really get your prototype funded, I think it's also being able to network with a lot of the entrepreneurs in Seattle, which is very invaluable, and get acquainted with the um, entrepreneurship scene here, which is very nice and friendly. Um, yeah, I guess just to echo some of the sentiments that have already been voiced, um, I think the, the biggest takeaway for us was just having the opportunity to bounce all of our ideas and thoughts about this business that we were trying to build because none of us, none of the four co-founders had formal business experience. Um, that was just, that was wonderful. And it was a really nice way, I think, to get feedback in a relatively short period of time um, because you're interacting with over 100 people typically within like a few hours. So it was just like a very condensed sort of interaction, and we always felt like the interactions that we had with people, um, in, in some instances, like vastly um, altered the, the course that we were on, so that was pretty cool. Sure, so we know that building a pitch is a very large part of the competition, so can you like talk about how your pitch evolved as you were 
participating in training within the competition, talking to the judges? Um, I think for us, so we're a technical company, and it was very challenging to translate all the research lingo into something that people could relate. And we play around with a lot of different models. Uh, but really, it came down to try to explain to you know uh, somebody with no biology. If we could explain our company to them, we thought we were ready to for the BBC. So that was uh, what we struggled probably the most. And uh, once we mastered it, I thought we were in a pretty good thing. Yeah, uh, for me, I think uh, I can I can uh, first uh, to say the pitch pitch to to advisors, and they will tell you what's the understand or they are not understand or is understandable or not. Because for me or for the team, we, we know what's our product and what's what's it. We know like 100% of that or more than 100% like understand about that, but we don't know if other people will understand or will like know what we are talking about and what's the point if they, are, they will buy it or not. And that's really important to practice or talk with others. Yeah, um, I'd definitely like to echo the two points that have been made already. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to know the your judges and who you're talking to and make sure that you tailor your pitch based on who you're talking to. Because at the end of the day, you just want them to make sure they understand what is the problem you're trying to solve and why your product is the right solution for that problem. Yeah, I don't have anything to add on top of what's already been said. Brevity is the soul of wit. Question, do you want to, sorry. Yeah, let's um, open up the questions to the audience. Yes. How many have you changed dramatically the, uh, the product or the service that you're trying to provide based on feedback from the judges? Like, did you start out with a completely different idea for a company than you now have, you know, your function? So we didn't, um, our product hasn't changed since we started. It's been more the go-to-market strategy and a lot of the business development aspects of what we're building. Yes. Uh, so how much time did you devote to work on this competition okay. for week or so? I, I didn't count. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have because um, you enjoy about that, enjoying the competition about no, everything. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, since the students, like, uh, you have to give us some additional time, right? How much time do you take for you? How much? On average, approximately. Oh, come on, be honest. <laughs> I, I guess I can start. Um, each week we had one one-hour meeting with our team, a uh, formal meeting with our advisors, and then we had two additional meetings with just the team working on the prototype. And I would say each of the, so each of those meetings are an hour, so that's three. And maybe I would say um, three to four hours each week working on your prototype and maybe um, networking with other entrepreneurs and also um, doing some research. So maybe about seven around there. For me, we basically meet with the team every day. And so we built the prototype from scratch. We we built the website, and it's all it's more about the CTO, the the co-founders. He works more on the prototype, and we work more about how the users will react to our product. So we just probably I think it's like one or two hours a day, at least. Yeah, for me, I was planning on working on this company full time after I graduated, so I had a pretty aggressive timeline to make it work and, and to win the competition. Um, <laughs> so, uh, really, 20, 30 hours a week, at least half time, uh, whatever I could get away from my lab and, and my PI and just work on the company, I would do it. Yeah. Well, you guys really made me look bad, huh? <laughs> wow. oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I guess yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, you're, you're, you're good. Um, I think for me, it kind of base base rate was like, well, actually, sorry, not correct use of that term, um, <laughs> but base number of hours per week was like 10, and that pretty easily ramped up to 20 or even more than that if we had deadlines that we needed to hit, like for the BPC, um, for like the Sweet 16 and stuff, you have to submit really long and detailed business plans, and I remember putting in a lot of time. Anyone else? Oh, yes, over there. When you guys started the whole process, how fully like, fleshed out was your actual product and prototype? Do you feel like you were like, developing your actual like, business model and stuff as you were going along? Mm -hmm. Did you already have an like, idea of what, what you wanted to do at the start? 
I think the question is about how you iterate it through the process. Yeah, so for us, we had the tech ready. Uh, we had published, we had a patent already through UW. What we would really need work on was the business model. And obviously, like the business plan competition is a, is a good place to start. And yeah, I mean, we built our business model around the BPC, and that business model has continued to change as we now spun out the company and started to grow. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think judges are willing to uh, believe in you when it comes to tech. If you're an expert matter, they're not going to challenge you too much on that. But they are going to challenge you, how, how are you going to make money? How do you know that you're going to get users? That's what they're going to really push you on. And the more traction you can show there, so if you have something that's digital, I mean, the best traction you can show is that you have users. The next best thing is, well, I've conducted a poll, and these are what people, what I think these are users. And I think that's where the companies that win can really show why they won, because they have a lot of traction. Right, just a uh, public service announcement. These guys went through something called the BPC. It's now called the Dempsey, Dempsey Startup Competition. Oh. Okay, just so you know. So I'm yeah. trying and to be a Google Translator <laughs> here for that. Yeah, the traction is really important. You know, I, I just want, I, I just don't want, I forgot to mention that we are hiring, and we are. <laughs> 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 I just, sorry about that. Our company is hiring, and we have full time and part time marketing manager, marketing specialist, and operation manager and operation specialist. And if you guys ever have any interest, please talk to me after the class. And also for the international students, we support uh, CPT, OPT, and even H1B. That's, yeah. Yeah, um, there for. There was a reason you took the class after all. <laughs> 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 um, for our particular team, we got the idea around the start of fall quarter, and we really just started brainstorming and bouncing back ideas back and forth throughout that quarter, and we didn't really start building until we got the prototype funding. And so when we joined the HIC, all we had was cut out square rubber gaskets, which are literally this big, and they're just cut out, laid on the table. And um, so we didn't definitely not have a product at all, I would say. Um, and we really worked hard in between that and the EIC. And when the EIC hit, we had we had a rough product. Um, we needed water to flow in and out of our system, but the water was leaking everywhere. But we were just we just sort of didn't focus on that at all. Make sure we had the whole thing to show the judges to see how it would actually work. And so even if it was leaking, we still pushed through it. Um, as for the business plan that did, and the strategy itself, that wasn't really developed until we were prepping for the Dempsey startup competition. So for us, we got the prototype funding, and that allowed us to create our first functional prototype. We've definitely iterated on that several times over since then, and um, we're finally at a point where we're, we're actually manufacturing nano droppers at full scale right now, which is really, really exciting. Um, but for the first HIC, we did have a functional prototype. Sure. Yes. Maybe, we'll, can I just oh, yeah. sure. maybe we take, because we're going to have a party after this, mm -hmm. and you guys are welcome to stay and interact with people. Um, maybe take one more question, and then I would love if you just have like a, something you want to share just about, uh, if any words of wisdom that you want to share would be great. So unless you have some. Sure, that's totally fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, Jeffrey. So you guys are all still students, right? You are not. Okay. Um, well, let's just assume you are. <laughs> <laughs> you guys started with an idea, and at the same time you're students, it takes a lot of perseverance, a lot of grit, and tenacity, patience, blood, sweat, tears, etc. fill in the blank. It takes a rare, special kind of crazy to, to continue on this path, right? Um, where so now we know your story of where you're at. Where do you see yourself moving forward in the next twelve to eighteen months? Graduating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've taken sort of a more backseat um, role at, on this project. Actually, um, a lot of the fellow um, chemical engineering seniors are actually working on developing the technology. Um, so I've not been as active on this project as I was, and maybe that'll change in the next um, 12 to 18 months, but as of now, um, yeah. Um, for me, um, after 18 months, I think probably I will lead the U.S. Fenton team, 
we will expand um, at least uh, five more cities in the next year. We, yeah, not 18 months, but 12 months. Yeah, I mean, frankly, it did seem very daunting at the beginning to uh, finish a PhD program, then you, just me and my co-founder, us two, start a company. Uh, I think now looking back, it's hard to imagine me doing something else. Um, the fact is that it's really hard to fail in the sense like the connections that you build when you're building a startup, the process that you have to put yourself through, you just build so many skills that you can then do whatever you want with. Um, so yeah, I think for us, we finished our fundraising, our seed round uh, about four months ago. We have a team of about five and six people now. Uh, where we see ourselves in two years is hopefully starting to transition more towards developing our own therapeutic programs and, and expanding partnerships. But it, even though it, it did seem really scary back then, and to some extent now, it, is, it's, it just seemed right. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, I let the um, panelists like share the most memorable moment from participating in the competition. Please, yeah. go ahead. Your, what's your most memorable moment? <coughs> And you just volunteer. If you, if you don't want to say, that's fine. Go ahead. I can see. Because the uh, odd thing I remember is I, um, I got the real confident, like confidence from the BPC, from Dempsey, the, the competition. And so I know what I want to do. And I know it can, successful, like, can be successful in someday. And now I'm halfway, no, I'm I'll probably start of the success, but yeah, I'm very exciting. So I think the the confidence is really important. It's that's really it's a good takeaway from the competition for me. Um, for me, when we came in first at the HIC last year, that was a pretty pivotal moment. Um, the year before we had gotten one of the runner-up awards. It's called the Jarl Award. Judges also really liked. Um, and Randall's team took first place, and I remember being in the audience. This is in 2018, and just being in awe. Like, I thought it was amazing. And I wasn't sure if Nano Dropper would ever get there, but I sure as hell wanted to try. Um, and so coming in first the following year was just incredibly validating. Um, I think for me, the most memorable is to pitch your idea, no matter how big or far-fetched it is, to a bunch of people and have them sort of support that idea. Um, as a chemical engineer, I don't know when else I would have the time, if I, um, to real, or not time, sorry, the um, opportunity to pitch to a closed room session or even to 400 people in these challenges. I think it's an amazing experience and you just got to go for it. So I just, did you hear that? Okay, so I, with the survey, I did about what people wanted to learn. Like only a small percentage of you said pitching, and the other percentage of like a higher percentage said passing. Listen to what he had to say. It's really important. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I mean, actually, mine was kind of related to that. So you're gonna not only do pitching. Like there is this part of the competition called the investment round where you have, I think, two or three hours to talk to as many judges as you can and pitch them your idea. So the first two or three, you're, you're you're excited. It's like your first time. You're nervous. By the time you're in 20, you're dehydrated. You're still trying to keep that enthusiasm there. So yeah, odd, odd random advice. Just bring water and make sure you're actually drinking it because literally you'll feel sick after three hours of nonstop talking. Yeah. All right, thank sure, you guys very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, we're going to close with a few thoughts. Please do stick around and chat with these folks and have a glass of wine or beer or... Sprite or whatever. Um, so uh, I'm just going to a few last words here, and then uh, we can stick around and have some drinks, etc. So um, I wanted to show one last vision and one last ABCs to you guys. So uh, remember Kickstart? You all looked at Kickstarters. Well, there is a Kickstarter that looked and said, "Yes, as a game, Russian roulette can be exciting." But uh, why can't it be strategic too? So they came up with the insight, which is you needed to get seasoned game designers and an irreverent comic person together and create uh, exploding kittens, because that's the real answer. 
And it is the top five Kickstarter campaign ever from this one thing. Their little ABCs, which are obviously hugely visionary, uh, they raised nine million dollars. Okay, so and they actually shipped the product. Uh, so I don't know what you should lesson you should draw from that, but I thought it was interesting. So uh, yeah, the longer you play, the greater your odds of exploding are. So maybe that's people want that. Um, okay, so just to summarize. It is motivating and important to have a vision and mission. An easy way to get there, I'm not saying it's easy, but a methodology to get there is to really think about those ABCs, filling that gap between where things are and where they ought to go. Um, you know, and, and Xiao Yu basically showed there's lots and lots of different sources of inspiration. Some of them are personal, some of them are frankly, business inspiration, like there's gaps, and some of them are looking around the entire world. Uh, and you do this over and over again. You guys have all done a great job of actually bringing together. Um, you know, you did a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And frankly, while you're here at the University of Washington, you get to actually get resources that people can't even pay for uh, when they're outside. So the BPC, uh, the, sorry, the Dempsey and the other um, uh, competitions are, are a big opportunity for that. So next week, um, we are going to go from idea to actual product and turning, you know, that is a real viable product. We're going to have a really interesting speaker. Ben Gilbert is the founder of Pioneer Square Labs. Stock in trade is coming up with new products and testing them and seeing that they're viable. That's what they do for a living. Um, we're also going to have Jason Sokoloff, who's the UW Foster Librarian, who is an incredible resource to help you do that validation. And one of the things I want to say to all of you is uh, he's actually going to walk through a couple cases on how to actually research your product idea live in class. So if you want your idea to be worked through in class for free by Jason, send me an email. Okay. And I will tell him in advance and we'll get prepared to actually do some of that live. Don't forget that. Please do that. I'll send it an email too. Uh, there's some blog posts, etc. And then there is a survey uh, that I would like you to fill out. Uh, some of you didn't fill those surveys out. I extended the deadline a little bit because some people didn't know what it does. It's the deadline's uh, on Sunday at 5 o'clock. So, and it's posted right now. So you couldn't fill it out soon. It's super easy. Okay. So with that, we are now, uh, well, that's it. Yeah, go. Um, if you did not fill out the attendance sheet when you checked in, please come and talk to Mari and Alec to make sure that you're counted as being here. Uh, and then that was all. <laughs> okay, I want to thank you panelists again. So round of applause. And then uh, here's what we want to do. Teams are important. So for those of you, I mean, I'm going to encourage all of you to stay. Uh, Alec here is going to help with this. But we have food, we have wine. Any of you who actually have a business idea and team that you want, to, you want to recruit a team for, I want you to raise your hands. How many we got? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about 10, okay? 12 maybe. I want you, after you get your wine or beer, uh, I, so how did we say we we're gonna do this? Come up here and pitch, okay? And we're gonna do them one at a time and you can recruit people and then when you leave start talking to people and anybody who thinks that's interesting or wants to join the team come talk to those people who have pitched does that make sense all right oh wait i do have more announcements okay more announcements uh, between you and food <laughs> okay so food is up here it's from lumpia world which are basically filipino egg rolls they're super delicious there's pork vegetarian and uh chicken uh and for those of you who are gluten-free we also have a gluten-free option for you that's over here uh there is beer wine and non-alcoholic beverages if you are under 21 please be honest and let me know and take a non-alcoholic beverage otherwise i'm gonna have to card every single one of you which because this is recording is what i'm gonna do anyway so thanks everybody <laughs> Turn off the video now. <laughs> thank you guys